Welcome to episode 63 of Silver Lining for Learning. And uh, it's a beautiful summer day here. It's kind of hot. I'm here in Oregon. And today we're really pleased to have Pazzi Sauberg and Alex Harper from Australia joining us. It's their winter time. It's early morning in Sydney. It's cold there, according to them. And, but no place is cold than past its uh, uh, birth country, that's Finland. And so think about Finland as the really cold place. But anyway, today we are really talking about um, play. Children play, play more, have more time to play. And the value of play and the value of play in education, the value of play for human development. So uh, we will start by asking Pazzi to talk about his book. He co-authored uh, a book about play uh, for children and also his actions about play, about promoting play afterwards. So Pazzi, uh, would you tell us something about yourself and the book? Yes, uh, Young and, and friends, thank you so much for having us in your, in your show. I, I've been actually following your conversation since the beginning. I think this is the second year now. And, you know, if this is a 62, you've been, you've been meeting basically every week. So, so it's been a good, uh, it's been a good run that you have done. Thank you for bringing people together. And certainly thank you for including this play theme that is so uh, dear to me and, and my, my uh, colleague friend, Alex, uh, as well. So I'm joining you from uh, Sydney, Australia. This is not, as, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not uh, originally from here. I moved here from um, Finland about three years ago. Um, and this, this very place where I am is, we call this a catechal land. This is the, the tra traditional country. And I want to uh, acknowledge those traditional custodians uh, who have been living and cultivating uh, this part of this beautiful, beautiful land called Australia for tens of thousands of years. And I, I want to pay my respect to elders, past, present, and those emerging. And while saying this, I also want to uh, recognize a couple of things. The one is that, you know, education uh, in different forms has uh, existed here for a long time. Thousands of years, people have been educating uh, their young ones. And oftentimes the education in the early days has been done through play, you know, um, and, and, and that's, that's, you know, that's why when we, when we talk about play today, uh, uh, we, need to keep, we, we need to keep in mind that, you know, people here before us have been educating children through play and playful activities successfully uh, for many, many years. And, and that's why for me, for example, when, um, when I continue working on this playful learning, learning through play at all levels of education, uh, it's, it's more about remembering what has been and what people have been doing, not so much trying to research and invent again some of those things. And, it, and this remembering in, um, in learning and in education is, is such a powerful, uh, powerful thing. You, but, you know, I came here, as I said, three years ago uh, with this idea uh, of, you know, what, what is the role of play and why, why it is that most parents, like in the United States, about 90% of parents, according to some surveys report that their children play less and often much less uh, today than uh, they themselves played when they were children, which is often 20, 30 years before. And it's, a, it's the same thing here. And, and when the University of New South Wales offered me an opportunity to work here, I definitely wanted to continue this play um, uh, theme as, as one, one, of the, one of the big parts of my, um, my professional uh, work here. And I came here, I came here with the manuscript of the book called Let the Children Play that I started to work a few years before I came here with uh, a good friend of mine and professional uh, writer from New York City called uh, William Doyle or Bill Doyle, as I, as I call him. Um, and we spent a wonderful month uh, some four years ago in Bellagio and Rockefeller Center's uh, residence there to you know, explore this idea uh, that we that you can now read, read in this book uh, called Let's uh, Children Play. And the book itself is, is a kind of an interesting, uh, interesting merger because it's a, first of all, it's a, it's an idea uh, that was put together by um, myself, who is an educator, you know, I was a school teacher and, and policymaker and researcher in, in Finland for many years, and then worked in the United States and Italy and, and now here. And 
Bill Doyle, who is a non-educator, <laughs> he's, but he's, a, he's an educator in the sense that he's a father um, and very passionate about his own son's education. And he visited Finland for six months and, and really fell in love, love with this Finnish way of providing education for younger children. So we got together with him and, and we put these different ideas coming from different parts of the world and from different perspectives. Uh, that is now the book called uh, Let the Children Play. And it has, uh, you know, it has pretty much defined uh, much of uh, our work and thinking uh, later on. Bill Doyle has been uh, part of the uh, many of the debates and conversations and uh, and meetings um, and policy developments also in the United States. Uh, for example, in his own city, New York City, he's been really advocating more recess time for uh, all the children in the public schools quite successfully. Um, interestingly, one of the accomplishments that he was able to do in his in his own uh, uh, son's school, Bill, Bill lives now in Finland, but before he left about a year ago, that he was able to push through a piece of legislation in the Department of uh, Education, uh, the New York City, that would ban schools from using uh, using uh, play or taking a play time or recess time away from kids as a punishment. Can you imagine that? That the kids are still punished in the schools, including here, uh, by you know uh, taking this free time, play time away from them as a as a kind of a way of punishment. So we have been able to do with this book uh, something like this, and I've been I've been using the, um, uh, the this idea of play and this book here also for um, as a kind of a tool to help many schools and sometimes systems of schools also to think about the importance and the power of play. Uh, together. Finally, I would I would add this that you know this um, it's a very important to to realize that the there's such a kind of a complex thing than play that is uh, is defining how children live and grow up and, and adults as well um, cannot be done just by educators and that's why you know we we have been collaborating during the last five years a lot with the pediatricians and. Uh, and medical and health well-being experts that see play also very, very important, but of, often for different reasons. So here I am now, and um, um, I'm, I'm working with Alex. Alex is my student. Maybe Alex, you can say something about uh, your, your own thing. But we see this pandemic and, and this, this very theme that uh, Young and, and your colleagues, that you have been having a conversation throughout the um throughout the last uh, 14 months as a, as a really as a silver lining for learning through play um, because many more people are beginning to understand how important play is uh, particularly when uh, when it is uh, kind of a um, disrupted in a way that children have not been able to play in school or play outdoors because of the, the many other things that have been brought by pandemic but that's a kind of a short story where i came uh, came from uh, to the situation where where a big part of my work is actually focusing now on uh, understanding better the what the play means and and probably more importantly what to do with the schools and communities to bring it back to children well thanks Pazzi. you know uh, the silver line is our playtime it's like our recess our weekly recess our play and I know uh, we, we want Alex to talk, but before that, Punia has a quick question to jump in before Alex. Punia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Pasi and Alex, for joining us. And I think this is our little playground here, right? This is the silver lining, as I said. So one of the things that I would uh, love, Pasi, for you to speak about, and then maybe pass it on to Alex also, is how do we define play? But we get, because I think we're increasingly seeing that even play is getting structured which to me, you know, is being predetermined or determined in which directions uh, play should happen. And I think that's such an important uh, piece here. So I would love to hear, Pasi, about how you describe or think, or I mean, define maybe, or maybe is not the right word, but how, how should we mm -hmm. think about what this play means, particularly when we are looking in this structured educational context. Um, and then Alex, you know, jump on to you, give us a little introduction ourselves, and maybe address this question from your perspective of the work that you do. Yeah, Punia, thanks. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, good, to, good to see you again. Um, you know, th this is what this is one of those questions. I remember I mentioned our, our time with uh, Bill in uh, in Bellaccio, Italy, 
a few years ago, we, we spent probably a good part of the month that we spent together talking about this same thing. How do we define play? Um, and just to basically conclude that it's, you know, it's one of those, one of those concepts uh, and ideas in life that is very difficult to define. As, a, as soon as you try to put the kind of a formal definition for play, you kind of lose a big part of it. And in the book, we write that defining, trying to define play is like trying to define something something equally complex and, and organic, like love, for example. How do you define love? Uh, you, you know, we all, all, we all know what love looks like. We, so we, we see two people in love, we can pretty much tell that, you know, that's, that's what's happening. It's, it's the same with the play that, that we, we, we sort of identify immediately when we see children or adults or anybody playing. We can see that, you know, the play is happening, but it's difficult to say exactly what it is. It's much easier to say what play is not. And it's often more important uh, also to do that. For, for example, in many of these conversations that we have had with William and, and others, we have come across with this thinking, uh, sometimes by parents, sometimes by teachers, saying that, you know, play is something that you do when the real work is done, or the play is, play is the opposite of, of learning in the school or, or work. And, and we, we try to fight against these types of definitions, because for us, play is much more um, it's it's a it's a child led uh, process that uh, you know includes ideas like experimentation and discovery um, uh, for enjoyment. You know, joy is particularly important uh, part of that. But you know, I would and you know the literature. If you go as we did for the book, the literature is is full of these definitions that people kind of define what the play is. But they all. Also, also mentioned this that it's difficult to give a precise definition uh, def uh, definition for play, but the but the, um, the the fact that you know some of those some of those things that it's a it's an active engagement most of the time. You know, play can also be something that you do uh, through your thinking and uh, imagination. Um, uh, it's it's a de definitely something that should be in uh, kind of a joyful uh, exper uh, experiment. It often comes with the uh, creativity and imagination, um, and it's definitely something that is led by somebody whoever is playing your intrinsic uh, interest and motivation to do that. Um, so that's that's a kind of a best answer that I would I would give in our book. We don't give any like a specific uh, specific definition as people often do in the concepts like this. We, we, we ask people to look around and, and provide, you know, some of these descriptors of the process that might be linked to of, or, or is often linked to the play. But let me pass this to Alex because um, uh, you know, Alex is, Alex is doing research on this and uh, has, been, has been working on this before here. So Alex, uh, what is your view? Well, I think um, play is a very complex and, and layered thing. Um, and going back to where you're talking about, you know, uh, play and its differences to work, if we go back to one of the early um, advocates for play, which is Frederick Froebel, he talks about play being children's work. Um, and I like thinking of play as a way of being. It's, it's a time when children or adults are fully immersed in the, in the moment. Future, past, irrelevant. What is, what is paramount is, is the now. And I think um, play is also culturally interpreted. Um, sometimes here in Australia, people might say to children, just go out and play. So it's considered a frivolous term, which sort of in some ways um, devalues its worth. Whereas in, in your country, Parsi, play has is three different words. I think I remember you saying it's not just one to try and capture the different, different um, environments or different ways people can play. So I think every culture views it views it quite differently. And I think that's what makes it complex to have a universal de definition. But I think in not having a definition, it makes it um, hard for people to access and sort of in some ways validate play. Um, I would like to add in terms of a teacher or a pedagogue's um, perspective on play, you've actually got to have a really sophisticated understanding of what play is to be able to support children with play. It's very much about observing 
and, and being part of the moment and as Parsi said, being child led. So you really have to have a thorough understanding of the theory and philosophy of play to be able to understand actually what you are seeing when um, children are playing and therefore you will know your role as a teacher, whether to enter, stand back, support, facilitate, how, how you're going to engage in, in the play with the children that you're working with. And I suppose the last thing I would just add is, I, I really believe play is a, is a child's right. Um, and I think by denying children play, you're denying them their fundamental rights as a human being. Chris, do you have a question? I have sort of a comment and a question. So um, I, I don't want to think that I've gotten too old to play. And I was concerned it, when I looked on the internet at definitions of play and they all started with the word children because I think people can play at, at any age. Um, so I tried to think more about that. And when, when do adults play? And what came to me, at least across much of the world is Halloween. Halloween is a kind of sanctioned adult play because it isn't highly structured the way that a game can be highly structured. <clears throat> and, and it is, um, you know, expressive in, in interesting ways, in very individual ways. But then I, I thought about the fact that play often involves modeling. For example, children will play with small representations of people because they're kind of acting through different types of uh, situations with people like you know, having children. And so um, there's modeling with Halloween too, because after all, it's all Hallow's Eve. The next day is the day of the dead. We're all going to die at some point. And so there's a kind of being playful about something that's a very serious thing. So I don't know whether I'm mischaracterizing play by this kind of analogy, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Chris. This is extremely important um, point. And, you know, some people have been proposing us that the, the Sekel for, for the Let the Children Play should be something that includes everyone, let everybody, let the adults or parents or, or uh, all of us play. And there's this, there is this famous adage that says that we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. But I think, Chris, what, what happens in our lives, if I, if I look at my own, own life and evolution as a human being, that at some part of your life, you, you, you know, you go to university, you can still have this playful attitude to things. You can have fun and, you know, go out with your friends. But then when the family life comes and you go to work and all those things, that you, you, you sort of are you kind of grow out of that, uh, that spirit and culture of playing. Then when you have your own children, you kind of realize that, that you know, that that's what the kids do. And, you know, I have to do my duties. And then again, when you, when, you know, when your life, uh, time goes by that you, you go back to this idea and understand, just like you said, um, the, the importance of play for all of us. And we definitely, we, we uh, actually underline this in the book as well, that, you know, even if the book is called, uh, let the children play that it's it's not just the the just the kids and and you know it's also a fact as you know Chris that you know people people perceive play uh, I'm talking about adults now in a, in a very different ways some some adults take it very seriously and to the heart in everything they do, like, uh, you know, the interesting experience uh, while, I, while I was actually writing this book was that I, I had an opportunity to visit Sir Richard Branson's um, home uh, on, on Necker Island in the British Virgin Islands. And Richard, you know, if you know anything about Branson, uh, that he's he's a very strong advocate for many reasons for uh, for uh, you know play in in his own life and in his own businesses and whatever he does. And I, I kind of realized that when uh, when I was there in the Necker Island for uh, four or five days with some other smaller group of people and himself and his family, uh, Branson's family, that, that he's really serious about that. that. Everything like all these conversations and meetings that were organized there were done in a, like a within the playful activities. Um, and, and, you know, his place, this place where he lives is full of kind of a 
go, you can actually go anywhere there without being engaged and encountered by a, a physical invitation to play. You know, go and try something or, or stop for a moment and do something by yourself or, or, or with others. And I, <clears throat> I think that that's very important to keep in mind for, uh, for everyone, uh, including, including adults. You know, many workplaces now are not designed in a way that people would be reading it as, as something that, you know, the play is part of that, um, part of that place, uh, let alone the schools. You know, if you, uh, I often have a walkthrough um, when I go and visit the, um, the schools, particularly high schools anywhere in the United States or here, I walk through the school and kind of a look, look around and say that how much this is a place that is inviting adults or, or close to adult students to play. And oftentimes, you know, I finish this uh, walkthrough, but, uh, just to conclude that there's, there's basically nothing there that would be indicating that, you know, this place, a high school is a place to, to play and, and or, or learn through play. Um, or if I look at the, the school as a place for adults to work, uh, that very little indication that, that, you know, the play would be part of that uh, thing. So, so you're absolutely right, right, Chris, that we need to, um, we need to keep this in mind. And, uh, and also, you know, while we try to return the play to children's lives, that is, you know, part of my mission that I try to do. Um, I always remind people that it's very important to, um, you know, make sure that you, that we adults, we everyone uh, play and have this kind of a playful attitude to whatever we do, because it's, uh, it's it takes us much closer to what we often try to do in other other means to uh, use our imagination and creativity much more to to things that we do in, in work or learning. You, you, you know, Pazzi, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the book uh, by Mitchell Resnick. I was talking about uh, lifelong kindergarten, you know, stuck up, well, of course, about this uh, uh, computer-based you know, uh, game play. So, so but I, I have a bunch of questions, but I will let Punia go first because his question might be closely aligned with you and Alex. Okay. Punia, are you on mute? Sorry. No, I'm not on mute. No, I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was quick. Okay, not quick enough, clearly. Um, so this is a great uh, discussion point for me, uh, what Pasi, you were talking about, because one of the things that I... You know, there's this whole push for gamification and education, the role of games in education. Mm -hmm. And I started wondering, like, I really love this idea of play. I mean, that's sort of core to who I am and how I think of the world. But I was never interested in, in this whole, you know, video games and stuff for learning. And I struggled with why. And I realized that there was a fundamental difference between the two, between this open-ended play versus the games, where in one case, the rules have been given to you. While in play, even the rules are up for negotiation. You know, so if I look at children, I mean, remember growing up in India and, you know, you'd play cricket, you'd see these kids sort of animatedly arguing, literally shouting at each other and what they were negotiating were the rules of the game itself. And I realized that that's to me is a very fundamental thing is that in play, that even the, the parameters within which you play are up for negotiation. And that I think allows for a lot more creativity than you would in sort of a game-based situation. And I was just uh, wondering what you think of this. And Alex would love to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, maybe start with you because, you know, Basi has been talking a lot. So we'll let you talk a little bit more. Um, you know, what your thoughts are about this idea of, you know, because we hear a lot about gamification and, you know, we play games. But I think there is a fundamental difference between how we think about play for learning, play for creativity, play with joy, and gaming, which can be, again, and not to say that's not important, but there is some differences there. And I would love to get your thoughts on what you think of that. Yeah, Punya, that's a really, really a great and a, in, insightful view of play. Uh, like anything, I suppose, play is on a continuum. So you can move from very unstructured to structured play. And neither is right or wrong. They're just different. And it's your decision as a child or an adult where you engage and where you move, you know, depending on your point in time. I suppose for me, I have a passion for the unstructured play, particularly in natural environments. I think the best play material is a stick. Um, it can be, it is the most amazing thing. It can be a stylus, it can be a building material, it can be a help form artworks. Um, it can be, you know, a wand, it can be anything. So that's more that uh, unstructured. And certainly um, when you're talking about that negotiation 
of play and children and adults, you know, when you're setting up the rules, that's a parameter. There's so much learning in, in that. And I think in play, um, while there is also um, evidence showing the cognitive benefits of play in terms of impacts on learning. It's all those other things that you're learning through play, your social emotional skills. And as we know at the moment, there, you know, it's becoming a crisis regarding children and young adults' well-being. And maybe, you know, it can be aligned with, you know, the shift in, in play. I don't think there's any causal studies that have or correlational studies that currently exist about that. But with the decline in play, there's been an increase in um, a decline in well-being. And maybe it is those things like you were talking about, Punya, those negotiation um, where people are learning those social emotional skills in play. Well, that's, you know, if, if people aren't engaging in play, they're not learning those skills and and I suppose there's a different way that you would learn those skills online than you would in the real world face to face. I think it's a very complex issue that you've raised and we're only at the beginning of the, really exploring what play looks like in, a, in an online environment and I, I think it'll be something that will be the topic of, of, of much research going forward. As I'd like to hear your view because Punya is challenging the idea about gamification of education. So, so what, 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 do you, what do you think? Um, yeah, you know, just like Alex was saying that play can play manifests itself in a very different forms. And of course, you know, again, when we were writing the, the book, Let the Children Play, we, again, we spent a, um, uh, quite a bit of time with this question of digital play and play with the, with the games and computers, and and we by no means we are say we are we are not saying that you know that would not form uh, constitute a kind of a one one form of um, of play. You know, play can have many many forms. That you uh, there's no question about it that there, there are individuals who experience a similar rich ex experiences individually and with other people by using digital gadgets and 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 gaming. But at the, at the same time, I think what we need more now than, and particularly now uh, during and after the pandemic, more than more than ever before, is this um, experience that we we used to have much more uh, that comes with the the fact that we have a free unstructured time to play in the nature, um, and you know the nature. Many people say that nature for us, all of us, is equally important than sleep or food or many of those basic things uh, that we we have and that's why that's why i think uh, more advocacy we we often hear about play goes to this free unstructured outdoor play that we in the in the book we say that this is in a way it's the kind of a highest highest order of play where you can just like punia was saying that that's that's when you can really um, uh, allow children and or adults if they do that to um, you know, go to the space where you have to negotiate the rules, you have to solve the very complex problems that may uh, occur when you are trying to you know implement those rules or figure out what to do, um, and that's exactly uh, you know what we want um, our children to learn in the school and 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 provide these uh, opportunities to communicate and 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 solve problems and lead themselves uh, these uh, these processes. So that's where the the biggest value comes. But we should not understand that that's the only form of play. That you know everything else is um, is is something else or is is not play. It's just like I said, it you know play can be something that an, an individual individual is doing. Uh, with his or her own mind and, and thinking or using technology or designing something and just, you know, having playful, um, uh, playful uh, experiences. And, you know, that's exactly just Alex was saying that this makes this a, a fairly complex thing. And we have to probably expand our views and minds in, um, you know, really understanding what, what the play is and what are all those cognitive and social and emotional uh, processes that go on when people um, are playing in a different settings. You know, Pazzi, uh, this, so this is follows of what you said and follows of what Chris was saying, you know, are we too old to play? So the, 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 the thing, you know, my, my questions really come back to to say, can you play by yourself? Because, so, you know, we, we as adults, we're always playing with our ideas, right? And so, so we play because, you know, I can tell you, there are several times I was invited to 
play with other people. That actually was many years ago in Singapore. They were forming a new group and they invite me on, we join them. It's a bunch of really funny people. I wouldn't name <laughs> names. You know, they're from Australia. So they had the <laughs> guitar, we're drinking beer, you know. But I have a hard time joining that because I, I can't do it, you know. So I'm constantly playing with my ideas. I'm writing books. But what, as soon as I finish the book, I pay no attention to it. That's another something interesting. So, so I'm not interested in, you know, I, I feel like I'm writing something, but then when I'm done, it's gone. I think that's like a play process. You don't care so much about the product, but you really enjoy the process. Once you're done, then you, you go through that. So I was wondering about your Alex and Paz, what's your reflection on that? I think that's a really important form of play, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Alex, you can you can fo follow on this, but I must say that you know, uh, young when I when I read your books and text, I can I can almost see the kind of a playful processes that you have been going through, and uh, sometimes even beer games or you know, I'm, I'm sure that part of your stuff has been has been initiated here in Australia during your work, but but it's it's exactly like this, and I, I feel the same way often that. Um, that you know, I, I'm I'm getting close to these playful experiences just within my own mind and my, my own head. Particularly when I'm trying to create something, new ideas, or you know, playing with the different different ways to see these things. And uh, and and this is a very common for for everyone. But you know, again, young, if if this is the only experience you have about play that you 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 kind of play with yourself i think you can do much more and i'm sure that you are doing much more and that's why the that's why we would you have invite the guitars there you can teach me how to play guitar maybe next time when i'm in sydney but anyway yeah, yeah but <laughs> yeah but you know mu mu music is an excellent excellent form of play and that's why often in a conferences as you know that you know people get together to sing and play and perform these things because it you takes you away from this as if before we end the show you are singing a song remember that you always sing a song on the stage <laughs> that what what we'll, we'll come to that point okay alex yeah what, yeah what's your reaction to that? but young you remember that this is sunday morning here so it's a, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a particular song <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I would just add to it, like what I said earlier, you know, play when you're really playful, you're, you're in that full sense of wonder and joy and a sense of timelessness. So when, when you were talking about your your play with words and writing, you're, that that's certainly play. And uh, I think it's, you know, that St. Mahai's notion of flow. You, it's just where you are in that moment and nothing else matters. And therefore, as you said, when, um, when that moment passed or when you finished your book, that's it. You're looking for the next playful experience because the, the energy and excitement and sense of wonder that you get in that moment, you know, it does pass. So then you look for, for the next opportunity. And I'd like to pick up your other point about um, solo play. A lot of people talk about play having to be in, in groups. I certainly think you can, you know, engage in solo play and be playful with yourself. An immediate thing that came to mind is just when you're, um, I don't know, if anybody else has done this but when you're lying on the grass and you're looking up at the clouds and you're just being playful imagining you know what they can be what are the what are the shapes of the clouds are they a dragon or you know just playful playful thinking and you don't have to have anybody anybody else there I, I think that raises another element of play which is how the environment um, structures the playful engagement and I suppose that ties back to that notion Punya was talking about gamification you know what is the environment that the playful activity is taking place in and obviously for me where I'm at with my studies at the moment for me I'm very much grounded in nature's role in in, in being that environment and and going back to Parsi's initial thoughts it's not thinking of something new it's remembering what we once had you know, as, as humans. Um, so I, I think the environment plays plays an immense role in play and therefore you can engage in playing groups all by, by yourself in many different forms, in many different places. So here's a question, uh, a more serious question. Uh, I know, Pazza, you wrote about uh, a Chinese situation called Anji play. Okay, so, so you... And you know how many people are opposing, you know, play, right? In the US, we're talking about, we got to have more academics in kindergarten. 
And so China, this is a, a, a interesting place. I've been in communication with them because of your book. Actually, I didn't know that that happened. And so can you tell us about this one county in Zhejiang province has started this play for all children creating the environment, I guess Alex was talking about is, uh, remember China is the country everybody thinks we should learn from because of its high PISA scores, of course, besides Finland. Okay, we're not talking about Finland. So, so Pazza, can you tell us a little bit about the story of, the, of this Angie play in China? Yeah, Angie play is a, it's a, <clears throat> It's an important part of the book, actually, because we came across. Um, I, I met the founder, actually, um, Mrs. Chiang, in um, in the Lego Foundations Lego Idea Conference, actually, where Mitch Resnick and um, and some others were at the same time, and and she was speaking about the um, this experiment that she and they started about I think already fifteen years ago, um, and and later uh, Bill Doyle, my co-author, actually went there and spent a week uh, in that in that uh, um, the school or environment there. So Angie Play, they also call it a true play. That is a, is a thing that they do with the very young children, two to four years old before they go to school. Um, and it's completely free outdoor play. It's a risky play. So, uh, you know, the kids can, kids can basically do the first two hours of the school day or, day or their day, whatever they want. They can build things and paint, they paint cars and, uh, you know, whatever they do without any adults, uh, adults in the intervening or rules. So Bunia, this is again something that, you know, the kids, they kind of design their, their rules. And this is not, you know, the important thing here is that it's not just, you know, every now and then, this is every morning, the first two hours of every day they spend like this. And then they go indoors and, uh, you know, the adults, they, they may film, take a video clips about this uh, when the kids are doing something. They go indoors, they wash themselves and have something to eat and then, then kind of go back to those experiences. And, you know, we are talking about two or three years old, uh, little kids, and they try to kind of understand what's going on and, you know, why, why they do these things. Uh, they often uh, turn these their own personal play experiences into uh, pictures or drawings or stories um, and I, I think that this is this is really, you know, for me, the Angie play is not just, you know, doing something that you want to do every uh, every morning, but it's using this play as a as a kind of a platform to understand what's what's happening with us when we have this opportunity to, you know, be with other people and design and create and use our imagination and, you know, you know, you know, think about the risks and dangers also that are there. Um, and when you do that systematically, I think that that's where this kind of a power of this type of play becomes to manifest itself. Um, so, so it, you know, this has been recognized now by the, I guess the the entire province, which is a kind of a fifty five million people. <laughs> probably, so we're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, now it's a, the, the, the Ministry of Education in, in Beijing actually signed this as a, as a kind of an idea of main idea of the early childhood education. Um, so, you know, young, oftentimes when I, when I talk about the book and people ask me that, so um, uh, where, where are the interesting things happening uh, other than Finland and Scotland and uh, some pockets of in interesting practice in the United States, when I say that it's China, um, uh, that you know, in, there's a, there's a whole province now, a whole country is actually looking looking uh, towards this thing. You know, most people don't just think that I'm I must be kidding. That you know, China is China is the last well, place. I thought that you were kidding. Yeah, children so I, I contacted them. I thought you were kidding. So I contacted them. I'm going to visit them. So, but but this, I think you your book also helped uh, uh, elevate the the project too. You know. Yeah, but you know, young interesting thing is that I've seen here in Australia some schools are actually doing very close to this Angie thing without knowing this about this Angie, uh, Angie idea. Uh, and I'm sure there are schools in the United States that, that kind of use this free outdoor unstructured play as a right, like Alex was saying, for every child. And then I, I think what we are seeing much less is the kind of a systematic reflection and helping, helping young children to understand that, you know, what's happening in their minds and between them when they do this play. And, you know, using other forms of arts like painting and writing and, uh, you know, writing songs about this experience this is such a powerful uh, kind of example. And that's why I think it's, anybody who's interested in this, just take a look at Angie, Angie Play. There's a lot of, uh, lot of stuff that they do and they share uh, and there are some Angie um, uh, kind of a sites now in the United 
States. Yeah, I've seen um, them, them, them the way you play. And you played that yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Punia, you have a question? You're on mute. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is actually a great follow-up from here. Um, but before we go there, I have this great story. I don't know, uh, you know, the Alexander Fleming who discovered penicillin. One of the things he used to do is he used to paint with bacteria. So he would take these uh, Petri dishes and he would take this bacteria, which were, and it was transparent. So he had to sort of know what color they would become after they had been put in the oven for a while. And if you go online, just go, there's a great article in the Smithsonian of these different paintings that he made with bacteria. And one of the interesting things there is he talks, there's this great quote about that, how he loves to play with bacteria and that there are rules to this game, but you, know, but you have to sort of push the boundaries. And in fact, credits that with the discovery of penicillin because he discovered something which others had seen, but not really seen. And so that to me is one of the great examples of this kind of play. Uh, that can happen at, at an intellectual, both physical, you know, uh, artifactual level. But I want to come back to this question, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, that Zhao just brought up about Angie play and which is happening at this younger age groups. The question I have is about how do you make play, uh, like school become about play? Not just that play is one component of it, but we yeah. look at the entire curriculum. They look at everything that we do, whether it's physics or math or it's poetry or um, history, that, that we have this playful attitude towards it. You know, one of the, uh, my dissertation was on the multiple representations of the periodic table of elements. I love science. I had gone through an entire engineering degree and I'd never knew that there were hundreds of different representations of the periodic table and chemists keep making new ones. And so, which means they are playing with the elements and the system of elements like Lego blocks, but we yeah. deny that to our students and our learners. So the question I have and Alex, maybe because you've been doing work in this, uh, working with the schools and so on, how do we make this playful attitude that, that chemists are taking towards the periodic table of elements, creating spirals, 3D representations? How do we bring that into what we call core content? so that we can approach school itself, every aspect of school as being play, because clearly the experts in the domain, that's what they're doing. You talk to a good mathematician, a scientist, a musician, they always talk about what they're doing in terms of joy and play and experiment, all the things that we talk about. But I think in school, we have not been able to make that happen in that structured universe that we have created. So I would love to hear sort of going beyond just, you know three, four, five, six-year-old kids, but looking at learning itself as play. Yeah, I think um, what you're, you're, de you're describing there is the reimagining of education, um, which I think we're sort of on the precipice of doing. I'm very optimistic about that. And I really love the sharing of the example of the Alexander Fleming. You know, it's that question I think that's inherent in play is that what if? What if I do this? What if I do that? And it doesn't matter if you make a mistake because that generates new learning. So that is that risk taking um, in, in play where, you know, with younger children, it may be more physical risk taking. Like um, it's raining here in Sydney. I remember taking children out into what we call the bush um, forest and the challenges of climbing a tree in, you know, barefoot or in your sneakers or when it's raining in gumboots, that's really high risk. But, you know, what if? What if I climb a tree in my gumboots? It's the same there where you're talking about the intellectual play, the what ifs with your thinking. What if? And the freedom that the playful engagement with ideas gives you to explore that. Um, and I think um, that's something that education, I think if you, if you go back to Socratic questioning, you know, it was originally education was this playful, exploring ideas. And the, there's an intellectual rigour that goes with that as well. Um, and I think somewhere along the way, education has morphed into schooling as such that is more a control. And this fear that goes along with that, I think that the, that's my, my personal um, take on it is this, you could try and control what's happening because there's a, a fear in the liberation of thinking. Saying that there are schools, there are pockets where um, 
students of all ages are engaging in um, more playful and liberated thinking and exploring the what ifs because there is um, a trust in students and a trust in teachers that they have the capability and a, co a competence to learn learn in this way. Um, and, you know, if you, you take teachers as well, you know, there's a, a lot of um, feeling at the moment that teaching has become very burdensome. And certainly when I started teaching, programming for children was fun. That was my play. You know, a child would come in being interested about a blue tongue lizard and I would see how the curriculum could map onto that. That was playful for me. And that's where I would get ex excited. So I think it's not only about students, it's also about teachers. And it is this notion of um, starting from where you are and where your interests are and imagining what ifs, what are the opportunities, what are the possibilities? And that's where your brain, or for me anyway, it, it starts it starts to play. I might go off on really random tangents, but um, it's all part of the playful engagement. I hope uh, that's I sort of answered. No, well, sorry, yeah. Alec, if I could just add one thing. This thing of because play and what ifs are always open-ended and creative, that's yeah. a fundamental problem in education because we keep trying to guide students to a certain goal. And I think that becomes part of that whole control mentality and that automatically then has this sort of backward effect of stifling this openness and creativity. So anyway, Pasi, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just at, at uh, three things that I, I <clears throat> always use here. I, I do a lot of work with the schools here who want to do exactly, uh, exactly these things. And I, I think three things are important to do in this work. One is, <clears throat> we, we, you know, we need to spend much more time with this question that we started this conversation, what is play? Because we, you know, people have very different views about play, you, you, and and um, this is not only just the teachers and the school, but this is a particularly parents. You know, parents need to understand what the play is and <clears throat> what are we talking about. Second thing is that we need to help people to understand much better why play is important and why it's a, it's a very problematic when we have when we see a lot of many more kids with the play deprivation now. You know, there are some studies that say that. Uh, up to one quarter of the children, young children, say that they are too busy to play. That they would love to play, but they don't. They, they cannot do it because there are so many other things that they do. So we need to we need to help people to understand these benefits, this this power of play, um, and also from the health and well being uh, perspective. And then <clears throat> the third one, and this is a simple one, is just to make make time for play. You know, play doesn't happen in the school or in our, our lives if we don't have time to do that. And that's why, you know. As we all know that, you know, most children, the older they get in the school, the busier they are with the things that we ask them to do. And, and that's why, you know, that's why we, we created uh, about a year ago this uh, thing called Global Recess Alliance. That is a kind of a global movement that we try to create um, for people who think like this, that, that we have in the schools, we have too little time for children to do their own things and, and too much time that is programmed and led by, by adults. And so these two, two or three things, I think will, will be a good starting point for, and it has been a good successful starting point for many communities and schools to understand what play is, why is it important? And how do we, how do we make sure that we are not too busy to do these things? And then this is not everything because then we need to start to, to kind of understand and accept this complex nature of play and learning through play. Uh, which, but it's a, it's a better to do that when we have this kind of a foundation ready. So uh, I know Chris has a question and uh, one of our most dedicated uh, listeners, John Helfernan from uh, Ireland has said about uh, hiring playful teachers like Alex was talking about, playful teachers, that's important. I just wanna add one thing before Chris jumps in is that, you know, play can be miserable. Okay, play is a miserable emotional process. So play does not mean you're happy, you're having fun all the time. Actually, play is very deeply engaged. Uh, I just want to add that. But anyway, back to Chris. Chris, go ahead. Well, I've been thinking about um, the fact that in education, when we identify a behavior that can be useful, we often think that the more of that behavior you have, the better. So tenacity, for example, now we have, you know, let's build up kids tenacity. As someone who has sat through many faculty meetings, 
there's a very fine line between tenacity and pigheadedness. And, you know, tenacity is not a universally good thing. Um, how does this relate to play? I think through self-regulation. Self-regulation is, is what leads in excess, is what leads to the, I'm too busy to play. Or sure, I'll play. Tell me how long to play for and what I'm gonna have when I'm finished and how I should go about it. Too much self-regulation is, is obsessive compulsive. Now, on the other hand, we know that executive function and self-regulation are important in life to some extent. But I think a lot of what you're describing is really a healthy balance, a healthy balance in terms of play that we've somehow lost because we get so into tenacity and self-regulation and other things that are all about controlling yourself and forcing yourself to do things that you don't want to be doing. Alex and Paz, do you want to respond to that? Alex, go ahead. Um, I think self-regulation is a is a is a big big part of play. And as you you you've got me really thinking, Chris, ab about that concept because I tend to come from a bias where I see self-regulation as a as a positive thing. And you've got me, you know, when you were saying the other side that to the to the extreme, it is not necessarily a positive thing. So I sort of was really thinking hard about that. You've really, really challenged, challenged me there. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. You've, just, you've, you've got me, you've got me going into my own, own mind. And, and then I'm sort of thinking what Jung was saying about that play isn't always, isn't always this, fun sort of element it, it can be hard work and um, cognitively challenging and I think that go that goes back to why it is so complex and why it's so beneficial and potentially why it's so misunderstood um, and I think then if you tie that back into the Angie play piece where a key part of that where I think it's so uh, a pivotal part of that approach is where they bring children at the end, which Parsi was saying, to self-reflect on their learning. So fostering those metacognition skills about what is actually happening and um, those those insights that are that are happening there. I've just got so many things pondering in my brain now, Chris. You've really got me. You've, you've spun my head out with your with the thinking about the self-regulation. Well, I'm I'm helping you to be playful. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and what you're seeing is, is the challenge there that, you know, which Jung was saying, which, play, you know, play is not always, um, you know, it can be serious. And I think that's a misconception that everybody has about play, that it has to be this fun and everybody being jovial. Um, play can be quite silent. It doesn't have to be noisy. It doesn't have to have this notion of... Um, jovial you know being jovial about it very serious very silent and um I think one of the things that comes to mind when I think about that is um another avenue of play that I really find fascinating is children with blocks and block play um the learning that goes on there the mathematical concepts the you know the resilience where you can spend hours and hours building something and then it just falls falls down I think that ties into your self-regulation piece what do you do and you can see children at that time particularly if another child has knocked down their building construction you know that 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 piece where well do I pick up a block and and you know throw it at this other child because they've destroyed something I've worked on and that that grappling of how you deal with that and you know most children you know will then come in and say well can I help you rebuild it so all of these um all of these other elements come in, come into play there. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. You've really got me thinking. So uh, that, you know, Zal, I don't know if you remember this. What's your Twitter handle? You got a fan, we got a fan club asking for trying to tweet you now. So if you can type them in chat, what will you type them in, in this one? Uh, go ahead, Pune. No, I'm just reminded. I don't know if you remember this, but this is when your son and my son were playing together and Tiger had built 
this huge Lego construction and Soham went and broke it. Um, yeah, our kids uh, grew up together, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah, so our kids <laughs> grew up together. So I, it just reminded me, Alex, of what the story that you just said. So anyway, we have one of our regular uh, listeners on the on YouTube, Priyank from India. So he asked, this is a very, almost, almost a pragmatic question that we talk about play-based learning, activity-based, project-based, and so on. So as an educator, um, how do you choose? Well, how do you, on what basis do you decide at which point you would have you know, a project-based or it's open play, what are some thoughts that you can, uh, what are some ideas that you can have in making those decisions? Anybody? Yeah, you know what? Know. Yeah, you know, one, one thing is that actually many teachers, uh, particularly those who are using problem-based learning or, or project work uh, investigations regularly, they actually do uh, already uh, play-based learning. And, you know, it's, it's, it can be simple like this, that you, you just, you just uh, provide your students with the opportunities to explore and experiment certain things and give them a freedom and encouragement to do that. And, you know, play happens. That's, that, that's the kind of magic of play that you don't need to, you know, children don't need to be told to play. They, they, will, they will, you know, most children will play if we give them an opportunity and license to do that. And, you know, I used to teach, I was a mathematics and science teacher for many years, and I used to do a lot of uh, kind of a project work in science, even in a high school, and just ask, uh, you, you know, my students to experiment or explore some ideas with a, with a degrees of freedom, and the play just happens. So, so it can be simple like, simple like this. Again, going back to what Chris was saying earlier, that we, you know, we, we should not do the similar things all the time. You cannot do project work or problem-based learning in the science or mathematics all the time, but you can, you can do it sometimes. And, and, and this, is, this is to everyone who is currently working, working with the students or children in a, in, a, uh, in a school or in education. You know, and this is what I've learned, is that it's better to do something really well once a month than try to do something continuously just like a little bit there. And this, this was the kind of a guiding principle in my, when I was, uh, uh, you know, teaching comp, comp, often complex and difficult things like advanced mathematics and science in school is to, to try to help your students to see once, once a month or once in every two months, something that you can integrate play or, or this investigation there so that they can use their imagination and initiative and do it really well. And then you can you can do all kinds of other things uh, in, in 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 between, but there are many things. My <clears throat> my bottom line here is that there are many things that teachers are already doing in the school. They don't just necessarily realize that there's actually play embedded already in those things that they do. Uh, some some teachers may take their kids to learn you know outside and look you know look at the nature and the play is there. So just let's make sure that we give them a room and space a little bit and give them a little bit encouragement to look at these opportunities that they have in these playful project-based, problem-based learning experiences in a different ways and just wait and the magic will happen. You know, the, I, I think today, in, and also in creating the work, what's really important uh, throughout this play work is really trying to bring play back, you know, into our lives. I, I think what you've done is not only for schools, it's really calling remind me about the importance of play in life. We only live, we don't live very long. You know, people live a hundred years, that's still very short. I, on, I don't plan to live very long. I, I, I really think it's very important. Come on, come on, young. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we need you. Oh, come on, you know, how many years can you live? Really, even a hundred is short. So, so I thank you, really, both of you, is the importance of play. I hope all the people who are listening to this understand that it's a, you know, you got to be play, but also at the same time that Chris said, you know, there's a limit. Don't play all the time. You know, if you, get, if you play all the time, you know, we're going to be in trouble. I love what Chris said. You know, people like said, you know, oh, you need the growth mindset. Everybody's going to get growth mindset, but sometimes that's simple stupidity. You need a rigid, a resilience. A lot of those things I said, it's stupid. You know, so we got to have the self-regulation as well. Okay. So playful self-regulation. But thank you so much. I want to let Punya introduce our next episode. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Alex and Pasi. So we have a series of three episodes that we are doing around play and creativity. So we had Vlad Glavino and Edward Clapp uh, last week talking about participatory creativity. Today we had Alex and Pasi talking about the value of play. 
So building on that, we have um, this whole idea that Pasi that you talked about that, you know, if you just give them an opportunity, they will play. The children come into the world with an instinctive drive to play and explore and learn. Um, and that these drives are shaped by our evolutionary past, most probably, right? Uh, making us who we are. And schooling in some ways sort of suppresses this. And so there is this whole movement around self-directed learning. So next week we will focus on this idea of self-directed learning uh, with our two guests, which is Peter Gray and Bria Bloom, who are both sort of leaders in that space. Uh, Peter Gray is a professor of psychology uh, at Boston College. Um, and he brings sort of an evolutionary perspective to this. And he wrote a book called Free to Learn, as well as he has a regular blog on psychology today called Freedom to Learn. Um, and he's one of the founding members of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. So he brings sort of this theoretical and practical experience to that. Bria Bloom is the current executive director of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. And she is herself an unschooler. She didn't go to uh, sort of regular school. In fact, even in her undergrad, she designed her own undergraduate degree um, and currently does a lot of, you know, has raising her own children in that unschooled movement. And so we'll be focusing on self-directed learning next week, uh, our usual time, 5.30 Eastern. And uh, it will be, the information will be on silverliningforlearning.org, hopefully later today or early tomorrow morning. So looking forward to that episode. And that will sort of round off this set of three around this sort of broad set of themes, which I think has been very exciting. So again, thank and you Yong, both Alex yeah, and Pasi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. And Young, when you have your, when you're celebrating your hundredth episode, I'm gonna take one of my guitars and we can play and have some fun, all right? <laughs>